Uh, tonight's guest is Americans, America's foremost cephologist. How many people in here tonight know what a cephologist is? Wow. <laughs> uh, I, I, I knew when I asked Professor Sigler a few minutes ago that, and, and he didn't know it either. I knew I had a winner tonight. So, Al, thanks for helping me, tipping me off to that. Uh, a cephologist is essentially an individual who studies elections as a discipline. And it's actually from Greek and has something to do with counting pebbles. You can all go home and Google it tonight and learn about it. But anyway, Charlie Cook is America's foremost cephologist. He's a publisher of the Cook Political Report and political analyst for the National Journal Group. He's a columnist and is also a political analyst for NBC News. Now, he's widely regarded as one of the nation's leading authorities on U.S. elections and political trends. He's appeared on ABC, CBS, and NBC evening news programs. Good Morning America, Tonight Show, I'm sorry, Today Show, Nightline, Meet the Press with Tim Russert. You haven't made Jay Leno yet, but sooner or later. Um, and, and has appeared on MSNBC, C-SPAN, CNN, and National Public Radio. Before joining the National Journal Group late or in June of 1998, Charlie wrote for Roll Call for 12 years. He served as an election night analyst for CBS in 90 and 92, and I have in my notes NBC from 94 to 2004. It's 2006. I thought maybe our bio was a little bit dated. The New York Times has called Charlie, quote, one of the best political handicappers in the nation, end quote, and noted that the Cook Political Report is, quote, a newsletter that both parties regard as authoritative. The Wall Street Journal's Al Hunt has called Cook, and I really like this one, the Picasso of election analysis. While David Broder of the Washington Post has written that Charlie Cook is perhaps the best nonpartisan tracker of congressional races. As someone who spoke often with Charlie, I can tell you that he's highly regarded by men and women from both sides of the aisle who are involved in the major stakes of big time politics. And I can also tell you that tonight, for the first time, I'm going to get to ask him the questions instead of him asking me the questions. Charlie lives in Chevy Chase, Maryland with his wife Lucy and children Rebecca, David, and Jeffrey. Please welcome Charlie Cook. We would also tell you that we would share the details of those events with you, but then we would have to lock you up here at the Institute until we release it to the press, and so none of you would enjoy that. Charlie, welcome to the Dole Institute. Thank you, Bill. I'm really excited. This is, uh, well, first of all, I have to tell everybody, first, I'm so impressed this crowd, look at this, but my sister Betsy and my nephew Andrew and my brother-in-law Bennett Dixon, who live in Leavenworth, are here, and so, uh, and I, hopefully she won't try to make a fool of myself, but, or a fool of me, but thanks for having me. This is wonderful. You, uh, I know when we, we asked you to come out, you said, you know, you really wanted to do it because you had a relationship with Senator Dole and an enormous amount of respect for him. You know, it was interesting. I was an elevator operator in the Senate my the second semester of freshman year of college. And it was such an amazing experience to get to see these people up close when you're, you know, you're just a kid. And, and just watching, meeting Senator Dole, I, it was like, wow, this is, this is, this is really cool, you know. And, and, but it was always sort of from a distance, and I'd met him and stuff. And I didn't really get to, but I'd always admired him, but I didn't get to really know him until 2000 and we did a couple of programs together and he gave me a free ride back to Washington on a jet, a corporate jet one time and there was like three hours of or two hours of undivided attention from Bob Dole with Bob Dole and, and he asked me um, uh, we were talking about something I mentioned something about my dad being a bomber pilot in World War II and he said, well, where did he serve? And, and, is he and anyway, and he said, would you write down his, his, his name and address? And so I wrote down my dad's name and address. And about a week or two later, my dad gets this package. 
and it was a baseball cap and a program from the, war, from the groundbreaking of the World War II Memorial with the w most wonderful letter. And I thought, that's, that's, but, but, you know, the thing is, there's just a side of him. I, I think that there never was a presidential candidate who was so misperceived as he was. Where, and if you've ever, I know a lot of you are junkies, you wouldn't be sophologists. Well, you, if you're here, you like politics. But reading the Richard Ben Kramer book, about about Bob Dole, what it takes, and, and the other candidates from 88, and you just got a sense, well, wow, this is greatness. This really is, and we just don't see enough of that. So I've, I just, at the drop of a hat, and, as, and because I've known you for so long, it was like, hell yes. I mean, I, 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 mean, I didn't hesitate. Well, let's, let's give the, uh, the junkies some of what they're here for, okay? The Democrats won a big victory in the midterm election. Speak to what you think were the key forces driving that big win. I think probably 60, 70 percent of it was Iraq and whether it was should we or shouldn't we have and then just sort of the way things have gone and the way it's been conducted and all that. And, and so 60 or 70 percent and then maybe 20 percent scandal. And, and that was like bad enough and it was headed to a bad place for Republicans. And then when you had the, the Foley scandal break on September 29th, hmm. it was just like the bottom falling out. And, and you know, here you had, you had Republican candidates around the country who, you know, they wouldn't have known Mark Foley from anything. And they wouldn't have known any of these people. And that paid a price on election day because of what happened, you know, in that scandal where it just was a complete free fall. And, and then, you know, there's a sense sort of a time for a change thing that happens. And you look back, and there were a lot of signs in 1994 that the Democrats were, were headed for a fall. And we saw a lot of those same signs this time. That, that, that periodically, you just sort of, um, I don't know, that time for a change sentiment kicks in. But it was a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of war in there and some scandal. But I'd say it's, you know, 70-20, something like that. Well... The trends that occurred in 2006 that helped the Democrats to win, obviously most of it being Iraq, not too much optimism that there's going to be much good news coming out of Iraq, although there is the possibility, obviously, that that could change. Are there going to be trends that occurred in 2006 other than Iraq that are going to carry over and have an impact on the, on the 08 elections, on the candidates? Will Democrats be able to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory now that they own part of Washington, a significant part of it? Uh, it, that's a that's a great question, and and you know we're early into this we're so early into this cycle, and uh, Lord knows Democrats have uh, you know I think both parties have self destructive tendencies, but I'd certainly nobody to argue the Democrats don't. Um, but but looking at it, it what what I find so interesting about the last three or four months is that um, you get a sense that people have really paid attention to, to history lately, and I I not the biggest Nancy Pelosi fan, okay? And I've actually been fairly surprised at how she's done. And you, you get a sense talking to House Democrats that they are very cognizant of the mistakes that Clinton made in 93 and 94. And they seem very cognizant of the mistake that Gingrich and particularly House Republicans made in 95 and 96. And they may make all new mistakes, but they seem fixated on we're not going to overplay our hand. And there's a tendency when a party wins a, a tidal wave election, there's a tendency for people to think they voted for me when usually they're voting against the other guys. And, and to vote against them, they had to vote for you. And, and there's a tendency to overread, your man, overread their mandate. And, and they may yet, probably will, it's human nature. But they hadn't yet, and, and the, I mean, the, we haven't seen the signs of self-destruction yet, but we, we, we could see it. But, but Iraq is going to be, you know, it, it's going to be a theme, I think, through the next two years, and I think it's going to weigh heavily in terms of what happens in 2008, but we just don't know where it's going. So you don't know if it's going to weigh heavily. If the, if the Democrats will take a little bit of ownership of that just by the fact that they are now in charge of one-third well, of the brother. One thing, I, I, as I said, I was in college in the early 70s in, in, in Washington, and I saw uh, it was disgraceful, the treatment that you, when you'd see a guy walking down M Street or Wisconsin Avenue in Georgetown with really short cropped hair, appeared to be in the military, the treatment that these folks got, these guys got coming back from Vietnam, w was absolutely disgraceful. And I think that, you know, you look at Democrats and they think, 
you know, they they got into power because of opposition to the war, but they know that it's taken a long time to get the monkey of their sort of opposition, well, the soft on weak national defense, weak on national defense, to get that off their backs. And the last thing they seem to want is to do anything that could be construed as non-supportive of the troops, undercutting the troops. And so they're trying to walk this tightrope of, okay, I want to be responsive to how we got into power, but at the same time, boy, I really don't want to step on that landmine of, 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 of being undercutting the troops. And it, it's real tricky because, well, I mean, you look at Hillary Clinton. Um, you know, you've got, you've got some people in the party that are saying they want a pound of flesh. They want her to lie on the floor and grovel and say, I made a horrible mistake. I made a mistake. And, and you know, in the party, I mean, there, there are these factions that are fighting it out. And, you know, they're having to walk a very tight rope. And so far they pulled it off, but it's, it's, it's a hard one. Let's take a look at the, uh, at the two fields then. Uh, since I'm a Republican, I'm going to ask the questions about the Democrats, and Stephen's a Democrat, he's going to ask the questions about the Republicans. Uh, so that should make it interesting. Uh, let's just look and briefly talk to the strengths and weaknesses of the, the big three. Let's start with Senator Clinton. Actually, can we go do her third? Sure. Yeah. Let, let's do Obama first, just okay. for fun, and then we'll do it. I mean, yeah, I know, I just want to set this up in a, in a, in a certain way. I... I, I, watching Senator Obama decide whether to run or not, it was really interesting because you could see where you could kind of watch his thought process. He's looking, he's got a six and eight year old daughters, I think. He just got, you know, he, two years ago he was in the Illinois State Senate. It'll be four years from Inauguration Day. And he clearly hadn't been in on the national level, the new, these new issues. And in so, there's so many reasons why this was not the right time for him to run. So many reasons. And, and, and pretty compelling. But on the other hand, remember that horrible song from the 70s, a Jerry Reed song, When You're Hot, You're Hot? And, and I thought that was a pretty good song. Well, you Charlie. probably would, Bill. <laughs> but, Everywhere he went around the country, people were saying, you've got to run, you've got to run, you've got to run. And, and he was most, more in demand than any other Democrat in the party. And, and people were saying, run, run. And, and the thing is, nobody's hot for six years or eight years or 10 years or 12 years. And so there were compelling reasons why this was too early for him to run. But at the same time, there was no way he was still going to be hot in 2012 you know, the next presidential election, 2016. And so you, you just had to watch him do this. And, you know, it's other people's job is to decide, you know, whether he has the experience to be president. That's not my job. But what I, what I would wonder and what I'm going to watch is, is sort of the electoral experience in terms of big races. Um, you know, you guys have seen tough races before, you know, in this district. The thing is, but Obama won his election to the Senate. It was the closest thing to an immaculate conception that you will ever see in politics. Not one negative ad was run against him. The guy that was supposed to win the Democratic nomination kind of imploded with a, 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 a spousal abuse allegations. The guy that was supposed to win the Republican nomination got sort of done under done in by sort of let's just say sex related things and 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 Obama and then Republicans they didn't have anybody to run they couldn't find anybody to run so they bring in Alan Keyes from Maryland you know who didn't even live in the state and 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 you know Obama ends up as a US senator and he's an enormously bright and I've talked to him a couple times a charismatic guy really impressive but he's never had a punch he's never taken a punch and so how do you know how he's going to do in a, in a tough campaign if he's, nobody's ever laid a glove on him? And, and, and then the, the other thing is that he's got this sort of non-ideological image he's projecting, which is, is great, and I get sick of this too. But the thing is, how do you vote present on partial birth abortion? You can be for it. You can be against it. But how do you vote present twice? And is being non-ideological, being just not taking a position? Because he seemed to take a walk on a lot of pretty big issues. And so I'm, I have a degree of skepticism, not about his ability to be president, that's somebody else's job, but can he win a really tough race? 
I, I, I don't know. I'm kind of skeptical. Um, Edwards, you know, it was like watching Edwards was like watching, you know, watching Carrie Edwards in, in, in 04. You know, after it was over, it was like watching this horrible car wreck. And John Kerry kind of falls out from behind the driver, you know, the wheel, and he falls on the ground, and his leg, I mean, his neck is severed, and his arms, leg, I mean, he's dead, and he's the only person that didn't know he was dead, you know? <laughs> and then you see the door on the passenger side open up, and John Edwards kind of gets out and straightens his tie up and walks away, <laughs> and his suit didn't even need pressing. And, and you, you think, they got out of the same car. How did that happen? Uh, and, you know, he came out and was first place in the Iowa caucus polls, the Des Moines Register polls and all this. You think, wow, look at that. But the thing about it is at the end of the day, he's still, he's still not any more experienced today than he was four years ago when he didn't win because of a lack of experience. And, and so, uh, you know, given Obama Edwards, I'd sort of put my money more on Edwards than Obama just because he knocked off an incumbent Republican senator to get elected president. He ran for president to get elected to Senate. He, he ran for president, was a running mate. So he's battle tested, but I don't know that he that projects, you know, people look at it and say, ah, that's a president. And then you get to Hillary and Senator Clinton. And I, six months ago, I was really skeptical about whether she could win, an, uh, uh, whether she'd win the nomination because I, I think there's a sense that, that Democrats just didn't, a lot of Democrats just didn't think she could win a general election. And, and electability didn't used to matter. It used to be, you know, when you were deciding who to vote for for your party's nomination, it was, who do I like? Who do I think I agree with on the issues? And, and then 2000 happened, and I think that 2000, that Florida challenge, it didn't matter whether you're a Republican, a conservative, or a liberal, or a Democrat, it just sort of polarized the country, galvanized the country, and I think more people, regardless of where you were on the spectrum, more people started thinking, it really is important who's president of the United States. And, and the intensity that I don't think we'd ever seen in our lifetimes. So we go into, uh, and, and so we go into 04, and, or in 2000, 105 million people voted. 105. In 2004, 122 million people voted. 105 to 122. That's a big jump because people thought it mattered. And so this, this electability was an issue. And, and I think Democrats were really torn. And we were testing this. Uh, I mean, you think about it, and, and I know we said briefly, but 100%, I mean, what percentage of all Democrats nationwide know who Hillary Clinton is? 100. What percentage of all Democratic voters had formed an opinion of her? 100. Um, her favorable ratings among Democrats, not Republicans, not independents, but Democrats was like 70 to 80%, but only about 37% of Democrats supported her if you gave a list of the five, six, ten Democratic candidates. Now, this is just my Louisiana public school arithmetic, but uh, 100 minus 37 is 63. 63% of Democrats obviously knew who she was. They'd formed an opinion of her, but they didn't support her. They didn't think she could win. And so we started testing this on a poll where we'd just asked the Democrats. We started a year ago February, a year ago this month, and asked this poll question. If Hillary Clinton is the Democratic nominee for president in 2008, do you think she would have as good a chance as any other Democrat of winning a general election? Or do you worry that she can't win a general election? And when we asked that in February, 47% of Democrats nationwide thought she'd have as good a chance as anybody, 47%. And 46% worried that she couldn't win a general election, even split. Then we asked it in August. It was similar but flipped. 49% thought she uh, worried that she couldn't win a general election. 46% thought she'd have as good a chance as anybody else. Then we asked it the weekend after the election, and the percentage that thought that she would have as good a chance as anybody else went from 46 to 60, a 14-point jump. And the percentage that thought that she worried that she couldn't win a general election dropped 13 points from 49 to 36. We're looking at this saying either A, something happened, or B, this is a statistical flu. And so we asked it again in December. The thought she'd have as good a chance as anybody else stayed exactly the same, 60. And the worry that she couldn't win a general election dropped from 36 to 33. And I think what happened was, prior to the midterm election, Democrats suffered from low self-esteem. They had lost two consecutive presidential elections, lost House and Senate seats in two elections, 
you know, there's a lot of doubt whether they can win anything. And then they win a majority of the House, win a majority of the Senate, majority of governorships, big gains state legislative seats nationwide, and they got a little starch in the shorts and started feeling a little more bullish, a little more optimistic about the party and about her. And her numbers have, have, have kind of moved up. And right now the question is, can anybody stop her? And, and I, I, you know, I think her campaign is going to look most like the 72 Nixon campaign. And I don't say that in a derogatory way. Prussian efficiency. I mean, organize, I mean, focused, disciplined, organized. Nothing comes out of her mouth that doesn't have, that isn't poll tested, focus group tested, dial tested, have a million IQ points behind it. Now, uh, and, uh, you know, she's going to have all the money in the world and the smartest strategist in the Democratic Party behind her. So you look at that and say, wow. And, 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 you know, discipline, uh, I mean, I think her campaign will be as good as her husband's, and probably she'll be a little bit more disciplined. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you look at that and you say, you know, she gives up a lot in terms of spontaneity and soul, but my guess is they'll plan for spontaneity. I mean, they'll, yeah. I mean so I, I think she's going to be hard to beat. Let's talk about all the rest of the field with just one simple question, uh, kind of two parts. Is there any chance... I'm sure he'd love to have a draft, but is there any chance that Vice President Gore is going to jump in? Is there any chance that any of the second or third tier candidates are going to find themselves somehow in an opportunity to compete for the nomination? I think Al Gore would love to be the Democratic nominee. He'd love to have it. But I don't think he's going to fight for it. And I don't think there's a vacuum. And they're not going to offer it to him on a silver platter, and he's not going to fight for it. So. I think we know the outcome. And for all these other guys, and I think it's analogous on the Republican side as well, think of like the, the Democratic field, like th there's this gigantic oak tree, Hillary Clinton, and then the two kind of medium-sized trees, Barack Obama and, 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 and John Edwards. And then under that with this big canopy of leaves. And then all you have, you have these little saplings. And they can't get any sun. They can't get any attention. There's nothing they could do short of saying something profoundly stupid, like, like Joe Biden, that gets any <laughs> attention at all. And so unless one of those big trees gets taken down, they're not going to get any sun. And they can't grow. And I think it's an analogous situation on the Republican side where, you know, as long as Giuliani, McCain, Romney, and, and Romney and more among the insiders are there, I don't know how these others get enough sun to really grow and have a chance to, to pick it off. They need a big tree to drop. That's a nice segue into the Republican Well, and you've kind of yeah, answered the question on the broad base of the, the second and third tier Republicans. We have to ask about Sam Brownback since we're in his state. And well, you know, the amazing thing to me is, you know, if I asked you, what's the one attribute you think of in terms of Republican nominees for president? You know, I think conservative. Good old-fashioned conser Republican conservative. And you look around at the top of this field. Rudy Giuliani, wow, if that's conservative, that's an interesting definition. Um, John McCain, um, well, that's kind of an interesting hybrid of conservatism. Mitt Romney, that's a really new brand of conservatism. You know, Newt, he's not old-fashioned anything. Newt's an original. I mean, and, and you have to drop down into the you know, second, third tier. And I think that's kind of astonishing. And, and maybe, you know, in another situation, Jeb Bush would have been the conservative. Or maybe, you know, George Allen might have been. But, you know, we've got all these exotic blends and hybrids and variations. But you have to go way down here. And, uh, you know, you'd think that a con a, an old-fashioned conservative could coalesce. But, uh, you know, all those trees have to get sick and die all at once before I think one of them's really going to catch on. So I'm pretty skeptical. I, I, you know, I think Brownback, I mean, it's pot, I mean, uh, you know, Huckabee, Brownback, uh, one of those two. I ain't going to be Duncan Hunter, that's for sure. I mean, but I'm pretty skeptical. I, I, I don't know. Although, yeah, I'm skeptical. Well, handicap the big ones then on the Republican side. You've got Giuliani, who's getting all the press these days and is leading in certain polls obviously, McCain and, and uh, Mitt. I tend to be pretty cautious. I mean, every once in a while I kind of step out a little bit. But here's one. I Listen to me here, okay? I will win the Tour de France next year before Rudy Giuliani wins the Republican presidential nomination. <laughs> and 
I'll do it without steroids, okay? I mean, the thing is, call me old-fashioned, but I don't think conservative parties nominate liberals. And I don't think liberal parties nominate conservatives. And it's just sort of simple as that. And I don't think that Republicans, I mean, Bill, you've been around the Republican Party a lot longer than I have, uh, but pro-choice on abortion, pro-gun control, pro-civil, uh, 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 you know, gay rights, civil reunions, uh, uh, wow. I mean, I'm, I mean, that's like the trifecta of cultural issues. And I don't think people with that pro, it just is, I don't think a pro-life, anti-gun control, anti-gay rights Democrat could win the Democratic nomination. I just don't think you could do that. And, and, I, I just, and, and then you get, okay, you say, well, but leadership in 9-11, and, and you say, well, um, but he was such a strong leader on 9-11. Well, what exactly did he do on 9-11? He was better than Kathleen Blanco after Katrina, but what exactly, what was it, you know? And then you get into all these other things, like an onion, you keep peeling layers back. Wait, your first wife was your second cousin? What was that all about? You know, you, you get an occupational deferment from the Vietnam draft because you're a law clerk to a judge? When did that become essential? Um, I don't know. I mean, I just think there's so, the, the, it's like watching a little rowboat filled with bowling balls. Six, I mean, how does this not sink? I, I, don't, I don't see it. I, I just flat don't see it. And so I'm sort of left with, okay, McCain yeah. and Romney. And I can, you know, I can make a case against either one of them, but, but oh, probably one of them is going to get the nomination, I think, one of those two. And, and you know, is McCain, uh, is there a resistance among conservatives and, 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 and a lot of people in the party establishment? You know, no question. I mean, they, they've never felt real comfortable with McCain. And, and, and the thing is that part of it, I mean, if you look at his voting record, I mean, for the most part, it actually is fairly conservative. But it's just that when he jumps off, when he gets off the reservation, he does it on high profile issues and in a very high profile way. So it gets an enormous amount of attention, you know, a lot more than just some other Republican senator getting off the, off the reservation. There's part of that. But there's also the thing is that, you know, Mavericks. I don't think partisans in general, but particularly Republicans, are comfortable with independents and mavericks. I mean, if you think about it, what is the opposite of a maverick in politics? I'd say it's a team player, you know? And partisans like team players. There's an old story from, from our home state of Louisiana that, that one time a young freshman state legislator came in to see Governor Huey Long. And he said, Governor, I want you to know that when I think you're right, I'm going to be with you. But when I think you're wrong, I'm going to have to oppose you. And Governor Long looked at him with disdain and said, hell, boy, when I'm right, I don't need you. You know, and, and you know, partisans want a team player. And so he did the Maverick thing. It didn't really work in 2000. And so McCain starts, you know, he starts, well, I guess I'm going to have to be a team player. And he tries as hard as he is capable of doing, of being a team player for six years. And he kisses all the appropriate rear ends and goes to Liberty University and all these kinds of things. And, 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 and then, you know, the, the signature issue, and I think that McCain, I do think he truly does believe in the cause of the Iraq War, but that's sort of his signature, signature brand of, of loyalty to the president is the war. And, you know, that's not looking like a huge asset right now. And so it's kind of a, mm, interesting. But, you know, and then there's sort of the age thing. And, and um, you know, 72 years old on August 28th of next year, older than Ronald Reagan was when he was first elected president, be the oldest newly elected president in history. Um, now, and he's had a tougher life than most of the rest of us. Five and a half years of torture in a POW camp three bouts with skin cancer. Now, in, in McCain's defense, he climbed down one side of the Grand Canyon a year or two ago and up the other side. Heck, I don't even go up two flights of stairs. I mean, I take my hat off to the guy. But, but you can almost see him kind of aging right now. So I, I think sort of I'm kind of watching the age thing and does the war kind of pull him down? Not that there's an anti-war movement in the Republican Party because they're written, but just sort of a, you know, do you want somebody that's got a little bit of distance? And so I can see why McCain might not win the nomination, but you know, I don't know, he's got a good sized lead, you know, over the non-Giuliani candidate, Giuliani candidate, so I can see that. And then you look at Romney, and, and 
I met Romney back in 94 when he was running for the Senate against Ted Kennedy. And I gotta tell you, he's one of the smartest, he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. Just absolutely brilliant guy, movie star, good looks, just incredibly impressive and a real analytical mind. I mean, very impressive guy. And, and, and one of the things that really jumped out at me, you know, when I heard him about a year or so ago, was just talking about, you know, when I, we said when I first got elected governor, my staff came to me with a problem. And I started kind of arguing with them about it, and they were just stunned that I was arguing with them. And then in the end, I agreed with the proposal that they had brought to me, but I said, look, in the future, when you bring me a problem bring me, I mean, the data. I want to hear, you know, an analysis of it. I want to hear differing options. And then we could kind of talk about it, argue, and then and we can make sure that when we make a decision, it's the right decision. And it was, uh, and, and I thought, wow, that's kind of, kind of interesting. So incredibly bright guy. Now the question is, does he get tripped up on, e, on A, his faith, and, and, you know, I, I, at first I thought that, that his Mormon religion might hold him back. Now I'm not so sure. I, I, I don't know. But the other thing is, can you make a complete ideological metamorphosis in three years? I mean, the guy I met was kind of a Bill Weld, liberal Republican, pro-choice, you know, favor of, of civil unions and all this kind of stuff. He was a liberal Republican. And now he's kind of moved all the way over there. And, boy, that's just a lot of movement in a real short period of time. But you know, compared to Giuliani with McCain and all that. I mean, one of these guys is going to be the nominee, one of these two, I think. And I can argue against each one, but we have to just kind of look and see which of these factors, these potential deal breakers I talked about, which ones do people grab onto, and which do they look at and just sort of give them a pass. You mentioned Jeb Bush a few minutes ago. I have a question for you. If Jeb Bush was Jeb Smith and he had no connection to the previous two presidents, would he be in the big three and would he be the front-running conservative? I, I think I would say no, but not for a reason. I mean, I think uh, this is probably not a great year to be a Bush or to 2008 running, okay? And I think that that's obviously clearly true. But the thing is, Jeb, Jeb made a lot of money in the real estate business before he got elected governor. And he's, you know, they've lived off of it, you know? and. He kind of needs to replenish the supply a little bit. I mean, he needs to kind of like make some money for a few years, and then I wouldn't be surprised to see him in 2012, you know, or 16 coming in. And boy, he is a really impressive guy, and and is sort of right in the mainstream of the Republican Party. And you know, I think he'd be very strong. But between the sort of the the the, the last name, not an optimal year for that. The needing to go out and make, make, a, make some money. And then the third thing is, um, you know, he's got the family issues. He's got a wife that never moved to Tallahassee that hates, po I mean, not dislikes politics, hates it. And, and you know, you gotta, and, and he's got a, his daughter had some issues. And so he's got to kind of get that squared away. But I don't think we've seen the end of Jeb Bush, but this just sort of it in the right year for him. But he is an impressive, impressive, impressive guy. Cutting the other way, though, is um, uh, obviously the last name Bush is a detriment. I've heard it said a few times around the Midwest, especially a little bit in Washington, that if Hillary's last name wasn't Clinton, uh, that um, she wouldn't be in the position to be running now. Is that, is that a common wisdom? Is that going to undermine her at some point that she doesn't carry the same weight, gravitas, experience, and she's just really a fluke that she got in there in the first place. You know, these things, they're, they're packages. I mean, would she be where she is? No. Would George W. Bush where he would be where he is? No. Um, you know, I mean, some people, um, you know, get a little, e a little easier or a different route. Um, you know, usually when people ask me, Stephen, the question, they, they'll say, is Bill Clinton an asset or a liability for Hillary Clinton? And my answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's a huge asset and is a huge asset unless and until he becomes a liability. And, you know, uh, it, it, I'm trying, we've got cameras here, so I'm going to be very delicate here. But um, if God told me today that she wasn't going to win the Democratic nomination, I'd just kind of wonder if something happened. 
can we drop it there? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, what, what does she do? Yeah. You know? And so that, that to me, that's the $64,000 question. So he is a huge asset money-wise, strategically. You know, it's like a candidate being two places at once. Uh, you know, and the thing is, you know, are there people that hate him? Are there a lot of people that hate him? Absolutely. But you know what? You know, you show me somebody that hates him, and there's about a 99.96% chance they hate her too. So I'm not sure he brings any newer enemies to her than one that she you know, that she's got. Or you know, I think you argue it either, but vice versa. Uh, she's probably a little bit more polarizing. But you know, can she win? You know, there are 46, 47, 48 percent people that will never vote for Hillary Clinton no matter what. Then there are probably 45 percent aren't going to vote for any Democrat no matter what. So I mean, she adds a couple extra points to that, but. Um, uh, but they're probably forty-five percent aren't going to vote for any Republican. But um, you know, it's not the path of least resistance. But um, you know, in the right, you know, I guess I'm, I don't want to jump to the well. I'll jump to uh, if I had to predict which party was going to win a general election the, in two thousand and eight, and if I had a choice of knowing either a who the Democratic and Republican presidential nominees were going to be, or b how many pairs of boots are on the ground in Iraq and sort of what's going on there? I think I'd rather know that. I think that, that's more, you know, more likely to tell me than who the candidates are. Yeah. Will the schedule of primaries have an impact? Will it skew it one way or the other this time around? The thought of, um, and I haven't followed in the last couple of weeks, but uh, uh, Florida, New Hampshire, uh, New Jersey, California possibly coming February up early. February 5th, yeah. I think there's a 95% chance that one year from now, we will absolutely know who the, nom who the nominees for each side are going to be. And the interesting thing is you've got the Iowa caucus, and, and with uh, Dave Yepsen coming next week, he's just fabulous. Nobody knows Iowa like Yepsen, and Rath is, Rath is terrific for New Hampshire. But, you know, you've got the Iowa caucus, the New Hampshire primary. Well, think of it this way, in 2004, we knew the night of the Iowa caucus, effectively, who the Democratic nominee was going to be. Mm -hmm. Because once Kerry won, I mean, I think we knew, I mean, I kind of figured it out before Howard Dean let out the scream. I mean, that, that you know, okay, Kerry wins Iowa. He's not going to win his, he's not going to lose his next door neighbor's state. It's over. Boom. And so I, I, you know, the thing is, all these states are moving up to February 5th. I mean, if all the states that are seriously talk about doing it move it, we're going to have t over 25 states, including California, Illinois, Texas, Florida, New Jersey, all in the first three weeks of the thing. Now, all these states think they're going to get the tender loving care from the candidates and the media that Iowa, New Hampshire is? Yeah, right. I mean, that's a national primary. This thing's going to be over, I think, b b probably before then, but certainly that night. And so, like it's all been for years, before most people ever get a chance to vote, it's going to be over. Yeah. Yeah. Can we go ahead? It's, uh, share some speculation on the possible VP nominees on both sides. It's, you know. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I think it, the three things I watch for is, number one, you know, the Hippocratic oath, do no harm. I mean, somebody doesn't hurt you anywhere, and, and arguably, you know, there's some, you know, I used, I've always said that, okay, Lyndon Johnson helped John Kennedy carry Texas and arguably the South, and that you had to go to all the way to uh, 2000, where I think Dick Cheney was a huge uh, positive force for George W. Bush, and I think Joe Lieberman was for, 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 um, for, for Al Gore. Uh, both, but you almost had to go the whole time without anybody having a huge impact. Now, I I've had some experts in the vice presidency argue, well, you know, Spiro was a little bit of a, a drag in 68 for Nixon, and gosh, I was in junior high school, so I, I don't know. A and that um, Dan Quayle may have been a little bit of a drag in 88, and you know, that's certainly plausible, but, but not huge impact. Anyway, so do no harm, number one. Number two, I would say either Pick somebody that can deliver one medium-sized state that your side didn't win in the last two elections, or pick somebody that, that addresses some shortcoming, some weakness, some soft spot that you have or that you worry about. And so, 
I mean, if I were Hillary Clinton, if I were Hillary Clinton, I would not pick Obama, and if I were Obama, I wouldn't pick Hillary Clinton. Because first of all, if Democrats worry about New York and Illinois, it's all over. And heck, Hillary Clinton beats Obama among African Americans, so you know that doesn't really help much. And there's sort of there's enough energy and passion and excitement of both sides, probably for either one of them. So I would, if I were either one of them, I would pick a boring middle-aged white guy. Uh, you know, like, say, Mark Warner from Virginia, which is sort of in a southern state more, it's now more of a mid-Atlantic state. I mean, that's what I would do. But on the other hand, let's say hypothetically that a Mark Warner or a Evan Bayh were still in the race and got the nomination, that's a fairly boring ticket. I'd want a B-12 shot, you know? Some energy. I, I'd, if I were one of them, I'd have picked, I'd pick, I might pick Obama, you know, just to give it some, mm, like that. Now, what does a McCain do? Um, he needs somebody really youthful, and 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 uh, if I were McCain, I would actually probably look at, at at Romney. I mean, somebody that's just youthful and vigorous, and you know, that would be reassuring like that. Now, if I were Romney, I'm not sure. I think because he's never done the Washington thing, he'd probably need to get somebody out of the Senate or somebody with real Washington experience. But I'm not sure who he'd pick. But I'd go for a middle-sized seat that. That, that carry or go or one or the other one. Okay, mm -hmm. we're gonna have uh, one more question and then we're gonna uh, open it up to your questions. Uh, as you know, Charlie, basketball is really big here at KU and we're getting close to the NCAA tournament. So people are always talking about how the Jayhawks match up against other teams. Give us your thoughts. What would be, from, from a Republican perspective and a Democratic perspective, the best matchup in the general election? Wow. Ooh, that's a that's a tough one. Well, I mean, are, are we making assumptions? I mean, if um, answer however you'd like to. Yeah. Wow. This is. You should have tipped me off on this. Yeah, one. I should have. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm just kind of coming up it was with writing the script. Didn't you? Read yeah. It? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm just looking at it. As, I'm, I'm trying to think. What's the assumption? Give me an assumption. Give me a. a well, a, assume that the situation in Iraq is roughly what it is today, and. Uh, just pick uh, whoever you think would give each side the best chance to win against the individual that you think would also give them the best chance to win. I think the answer I would give is that assuming that Romney's faith hasn't caused a backlash, I think I'd want somebody that wasn't anywhere near Washington for the last five years. Somebody that's been supportive of the president, so, you know, and, and uh, not been jumping, you know, getting off the road, but, but someone who has no fingerprints on anything that's happened in the last six years. Somebody that's just sort of, you know, hey, I, you know, I was running my state and balancing the budget and cutting taxes and, you know, I, I you know, I, I, oh, I know, you know, I mean, I, I got, I, I'd probably be the, the, the strongest matchup. And so, you know, we'll you know we'll know early on either his faith is a problem or it's not a problem, and and I I can't judge I can't judge at this point, but I think that would actually be a little bit stronger. I mean, and now most people have never heard of Mitt Romney at this point, and and you know, and I think we make a we make a mistake assuming that, but the fact that you're here, unless you were drug here by a spouse or something, you know, you're not normal, okay, and and and. <laughs> I, I was in San Diego the weekend on Friday. Um, Rudy Giuliani, you know these day-long motivational Zig Ziglar things with all these motivational speeches, and and Rom and, and and Giuliani had already contracted to do this, and so he was given a motivational speech of this thing. And the the local news was interviewing this lady coming out of it, and the the the, the TV guy said, um, "What do you think about Rudy Giuliani running for president?" And this lady said. Really? That's really interesting. I think he'd be great. She had no idea he was running for president. <laughs> and, and, you know, normal people aren't consumed by this stuff until the last couple of weeks or month or so. And so I think we make sort of assumptions that people watch this stuff as closely as all of us do. Um, I forgot where we were going with this. And what about your pick on the Democratic side? I. I think they would have been better. I think Democrats, the optimal would be a really boring middle-aged white guy who could just take advantage of the time for change, 
whatever's going on in Iraq. I mean, you know, to me, the path of least resistance would have been like a Mark Warner type. Okay. Because, I mean, if you think about it, um, five times since the end of World War II, a party's held the White House for, tw for eight consecutive years, two terms. Four times out of five, they were not able to get a third term. You know, it's like somebody said, every farmer knows you every once in a while you have to rotate the crops. You rotate the tires on your car. You know, people, just a time for a change sentiment. And I think the path of least resistance would be somebody who doesn't rock the boat, is absolutely acceptable, you know, sort of uh, Safeway vanilla, you know, doesn't offend anybody and can take advantage of the time for change. No, he's not running. So it's purely academic. Instead, they'll probably go with somebody with a little bit more distinctive flavor that people may like or they may turn off and it's whether it's a Hillary Clinton or whether it's a you know uh, John Edwards or whether it's a Barack Obama or Bill Richardson or you know I mean unless Tom Vilsack breaks through you know it's pretty you know I ain't gonna be Joe Biden that's for sure um, I mean it's more likely gonna be somebody with some edges on them that that might alienate some folks and so uh, you know I guess the answer that they'd say is you gotta break in some eggs to make an omelet but I, I'd go with some I mean I I'd go with somebody really boring and just take advantage of the time for change, but they're clearly, they're not going to do that. Right. Democrats have done that a lot in the past, though, and it hasn't worked out so well. For well, but the thing is, but not necessarily a stiff. I mean, <laughs> okay, not... point. <laughs> I don't want to, see, the thing is, I don't want to offend anybody uh, that Steve has worked for in yeah. the past that his previous for all life, but... Move, moving right along, uh, <laughs> uh, it's time for you to, uh, to interact with Charlie and ask questions. Please raise your hand wait for a microphone to come to you and then uh, I'm gonna call on uh, uh, I'll call on the person just go to the first one you see Sarah get this gentleman right here Thank you, uh, Charlie I think in a way you've already answered this question but should this surge in Iraq actually work or come close to working and say a year from now uh, there's a, a marked decrease in sectarian violence and it looks like the Iraqi government actually has their act together what what does that do for the presidential election in 2008? I mean, what you're basically saying is if you take a big problem off the table, would Republicans be better off? Heck yeah, of course. I mean, I'm no military expert. I'd defer to Bennett, my brother-in-law. But, but you know, the, the, the question I would ask is, let's say this is exactly the right thing to do, okay? The question I would ask is, politically speaking, is the president's surge going to be given the time to work? Assuming, uh, stipulating that it is the right thing, and which means that will Republicans on the Hill hang in there long enough to let it work? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, those guys, what's the expression? As, as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. Uh, those guys are real nervous. I mean, most of them, all but 17 in the House, all but, what, seven, six? Seven, eight, and and the, and the Senate, they're hanging in there for right now. But um, you know, the thing about politicians, whether Republicans, Democrats, doesn't matter. Um, they know that the last edition of Profiles and Courage has already gone to the printer. You know, and um, you know, you ain't making any new editions. And so, um, I don't know whether I I just wonder whether it 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 better start turning by June, July, August because you know let's say it wouldn't you wouldn't see it you wouldn't feel it you couldn't touch it turning until September October November December let's just say wow I I don't think I don't know that he's gonna have that much time so that's that's Becca do you have somebody back there get this gentleman the red shirt here Whenever I hear discussions about national politics uh, in the last couple of years, it always mentions evangelical Christians as some kind of uh, uh, superpower. I'm curious as to what percentage of the voters you th fall in that category and how much you really believe they uh, that group influences uh, what could influence this election. Well, if you, I mean, it's clearly a definition of terms. You ask people, um, do you consider yourself born again? I think the last figure I saw, like 40, 41. But that doesn't mean of all voters. Now, but that doesn't mean there are any votes on that, votes in that way. 
and and um, I don't know, 10, 12, something like that probably jumps to mind. But the thing about it is what we're talking, what I'm talking about though, is in Republican primaries, in Republican caucuses, and 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 in that case, you know, let's let's just make up a number. Let's just say 10 percent of the electorate. But if it's 10 percent of the electorate, that means it's uh, not quite a quarter of the people that would vote in a primary, maybe a third, maybe, of the people would vote in a caucus. And that's a pretty substantial group of people. And, and I would argue that it, 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 it's a group, like a lot of other groups in both parties, that can't necessarily dictate who will get a nomination, but I think they sure as heck could veto somebody effectively. And that's what I would say. But, it, but you know, I think these things go in, in um, they go in cycles. And I think we went through a time when um, cultural conservatives, evangelical Christians, where they became just really well organized, really motivated, really energized, and, and had an outsized uh, influence, certainly within the Republican Party. And, and the question I have is, is that going to remain at that point? level or does it come down a little bit? Is there a certain disillusionment, you know, from the last couple of years? And, and the so you know, like the Foley thing, I, I, you know, I just got the impression that for a lot of cultural conservatives, that whole episode, it was like getting hit on the side of the head with a baseball bat. It was like, what, what's this? And, and, and it's kind of taken aback a little bit. And so, uh, I mean, it's not 50% or anything like that, but within primaries and caucuses, it, it's pretty influential, as would be in an analysis group on the, other, on the Democratic side. This side of the room. Question back there in the back on the aisle. Charlie, does, um, do you think political strategists uh, consciously use negative advertising to dry try and drive down um, voter uh, participation? I think strategists um, use it for a variety of reasons, and that's one. But I, I saw this, um, I don't know whether it was delicious or, or troubling, but I saw a Republican consultant quoted during the fall saying, I sleep better knowing that my clients are on with negative ads. And we might as well put those words in a lot of Democratic consultants' mouths, too that everybody wrings their hands and says, you know, gosh, negative advertising is terrible, it's horrible. But if that stuff didn't work, they, it wouldn't get used. I mean, it really wouldn't. It wouldn't. And, you know, there have been studies that show that people are five, six, seven times more likely to believe and remember something that's in a negative ad than something that's in a positive ad. And, and I think Frankly, I think part of it is that people are more willing, more ready to believe something that is uh, that is negative about a politician than something that is public that is positive about a public politician. And so the stuff does work. Now, does it work as persuasion uh, to a certain extent? But I think you really hit on it. Is a lot of it is trying to drive down enthusiasm in the other party. I mean, if uh, you know, yeah, I'd like to change somebody's minds. But if I can't change, if I can't get some people on this side of the room to switch over to this side of the room, if they just leave instead, hey, that's all right, works for me, you know, and that's what effectively it is. So uh, I, I think that, that doing it as a, as, as a vote suppression, but, but both sides, I mean, to say that one side is more guilty than the other, uh, if there's a difference, I've never noticed it. Question right there. You, you haven't mentioned anything about the possibility of third-party candidates like Ralph Nader or Ross Perot. What are the odds of that? I was waiting on you. Uh, I, um, it, it's fascinating to me that, that people, you know, we, in, a, in a lot of ways we've almost institutionalized the two-party system. I mean, the fix is kind of in. But at the same time, I think the American people have long been very receptive of the idea I mean, they, it's funny, 90, you know, if you say, do you consider yourself a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent? 
And you know, it was when the Gallup organization does that, you know, and they aggregate all their polls for for the course of a year. And in '06, it was <coughs> like a little over 30,000 interviews, which, you know, wow. And and when they did it in 2005, it was basically 33, 33, 33. And then when they put all their interviews together for 2006, Democrats went up by a point. Republicans dropped three, so it was like 34, 30 with the rest independent. But then when you take the independents, and if you ask them, well, do you lean to the Republican side or do you lean to the Democratic side? And this is important because historically, people who call themselves independents, but if they say they lean to the Republican side, they usually vote almost as Republican as Republicans do. And the same thing for people that call themselves independents but lean to the Democratic side, that some people have some deep interceded need to call themselves independents, but functionally speaking, they're partisans. Anyway, when you do that, it went, this for 06, went to 50-40, 50 Democrat, 40 Republican, 10, 10 independent. And that's the widest it's been since 1991 when Gallup started doing that. So you've got about a 10, call it 10, 11 percent that's a hardcore independent. But I think even beyond that, even people call themselves Democrats, call themselves Republicans, a lot of them, you know, they may call themselves one or the other, but they're very cognizant of their own side's shortcomings, you know? And they're kind of open to a, the right independent third party candidate. And you look back at, at, think back at 92. I mean, remember in June of 92, there was a point where Ross Perot was in first place. Clinton was sec was he had like 37, 38 or something like that. Clinton was in second. And President Bush was in third place at one point. And the thing is, people liked the idea of this non-politician, a non-Washingtonian, a, a, a uh, you know, this can-do, self-made man. You know, President Carter couldn't get the hostages out of Iran, but 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 by gosh, uh, Ross Perot could get his EDS employees out. I mean, they loved that. And then um, they found out he was kind of um, a little wacky, and he's. <laughs> And he still got 19% of the vote, which is a lot, 19%. And that was after, you know, you know, hiring private detectives to follow his daughter's boyfriends and what was it, the Cubans that were running across the lawn at his daughter's wedding? And Was there know, an alien visitation among them? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was, you know, uh, the fact that the guy got 19% after all, that's pretty, uh, that's, that, t that should tell us something. And the fact that he had been in first place. I think people are open to that, but whenever you have a third party candidate or movement start to really get going, one party or the other invariably is smart enough to see it and to steal their issues and grab them away. And that's what you saw where in 94, Newt Gingrich was smart enough to see that Perot's anti-Washington, anti-politician, outsider themes were really resonating with people. And that Pro may have been a flawed vehicle, but the message was strong. And so Gingrich sort of appropriated the message, and that's what they wrote on to win control of the House for the first time in 40 years. So but I think there really is an opening there. The question is, you've got to have somebody who is either already incredibly well known or has all the money in the world, or preferably both. Now, I think a, uh, in 96, 2000, 2004, I think a Cohen Powell was somebody that could have done that. Um, Giuliani, I mean, there, there's a lot of things to look at Giuliani, but, but I think Giuliani could theoretically, I, I could see Giuliani get on the ballot in all 50 states. I could see him raising 100, 150, 200 million bucks. I could see him actually having a chance to win as an independent. Um, now the question is, what about Michael Bloomberg? Now I was a little resistant to this early on because I was thinking, what's the story here? I mean, with Giuliani you had this reform prosecutor who gets elected mayor of New York and turns this disaster of a city into something that's really actually pretty good. And, you know, what a great story. And Bloomberg's story is he took a city that had already been turned around and kind of incrementally improved on it. Well, that's not a real sexy story. And, you know, he made a billion bucks or two selling some kind of a computer stuff to Wall Street. Uh, that's not exactly the, 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 the Ross Perot story, you know? I mean, it's, it's impressive, wish it was me, but, but it's not one that, but tell you what though, the guy can spend 500 million bucks of his own money. I bet you with 500 million bucks and hiring smart guys like Lacey and Steven, they can make me look good after 500 million dollars. You know, they make anybody look good. And so, you know, he's somebody, but the thing is it, it needs the right person 
and just anybody I mean it's, so the question is, is the right person there and do they present themselves to take advantage of this angst that people have towards both parties and that's what the, my, my skepticism I'll sign on with Bloomberg as soon as you win the Tour de France. <laughs> Heck, now this gentleman's had his hand up. Yes, sir. Just, just wait, wait for the, the microphone, hold on. sir. There you go. There you go. You came close to matching Richardson. How about Richardson? I guess I have a disadvantage of having known Bill since the 70s when we both worked on Capitol Hill together, okay? And uh, slept on his couch one weekend in Santa Fe with he and his wife uh, back in 1978. And so anybody that you've known that well and that long, <laughs> your first. you're never going to get elected president. I mean, you know, I mean, you, you know what I mean? I'm teasing. But the question I have is, is Bill, is Bill focused? Is he disciplined? Is he going to, you know, to, to me, to win the presidency, you have to be willing to drive over your own grandmother, back up, do it again and back up and do it again. I mean, it's just this myopic, relentless drive so that, you know, you wonder, could any normal person, reason, remotely normal person, ever win the presidency? And to me, that was the theme of the Ford funeral, was here's this man that never even thought about being president, never tried, and he ends up being president. It was a, you know, fairly normal you know, reasonably close to saying to a normal guys, we're probably going to get, you know, in the next, you know. But, but for Bill, I mean, oh, look, it's a magic resume, you know. Uh, Fletcher School of Diplomacy at Tufts. I think he did a year or two in the Foreign Service, you know, some, uh, member of the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, you know, great committee, UN Ambassador, Secretary of Energy, Governor of a state. We know that governors have a great... The, the recipe's there. It's a magic recipe. But the thing is, we're, what does he have to do to get noticed when you've got Clinton, Obama, and, and even Edwards out there? How does he break through? Even in Iowa, how does he break through? I mean, you've got, you know, people have a choice. They can go see Obama or Hillary Clinton over here or go see Bill Richardson over there. You know, where the crowd's going to be? What's the interest? And, and so I just don't know how Bill gets the money and breaks through, even though he's got a, 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 great, he's got a great recipe. And, and I'll tell you, one time I was, um, we were talking about, what we were talking earlier, I think it was 1996, and I was on a plane from Des Moines to Chicago. It was after a Republican function or out, out watching some of the candidates. And, and, and Richard Luger, senator from Indiana, was on the plane, and he, he kind of thought he was running for president. And, 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 and he's a guy who is, you know, was a Rhodes Scholar, mayor of Indianapolis. If any of you have been to Indianapolis, I mean, he really turned the city around, chair of the Farm Relay. I mean, brilliant guy, so capable. I mean, and, and, and he'd been out there, and I remember looking over and saying, thinking, you think this thing's really on the level, don't you? <laughs> I, I mean, you know, in, uh, you know, I mean, he had even more of a chance to win than I did. And I mean, so I, I'm just, I, I like Bill a lot, but I'm very skeptical that he can break through. And it's sort of a, you know, you could say maybe he should be able to, or maybe not, you know, but I'm, you know, but but again, I'm I'm not necessarily. That's something you all probably ought to ask somebody that hadn't known him as long. And and you know, anybody it's, that you've known for a long time, it's kind of hard to imagine him being president of the United States. I mean, you know, but it's probably not fair. But questions on this side. Um, when you advise, so uh, wave your wave your hand so I can see where there. Okay, stand I got gotcha. up if you would. Please. I got gotcha. you. When you advise the uh, Democrats to be strategic and uh, nominate a boring middle-aged white man, you implied that race and gender are still handicaps to national election campaign. Would you speak more directly upon how great a handicap you think these, those factors still are? First of all, I, I would say, and I'm not going back on what I said, but let me just say, number one, that the data does not support what I said, but and that if you if you look at the polling that's out there, it's very interesting. Like, for example, the NBC Wall Street Journal poll back in December, and they gave people 12 different characteristics. 
of, of and, and would this characteristic make you enthusiastic, very comfortable, have, it's, wait a minute, I've got it right here. Enthusiastic, comfortable, have some reservations, or very uncomfortable, okay? And the 12 things were, uh, and some were positive, some were negative, some depends on who you are. You know, someone with a military background, an African-American, a woman, uh, a senator with experience in legislative international affairs, a Jewish person, a governor who has experience in gov as a government executive and in state matters, uh, a Hispanic, a gay or lesbian person, an evangelical Christian, someone who has experience as a member of George W. Bush's cabinet, a Mormon, or someone over age 70, okay? Those are the 12 factors, I gave you the four characteristics. Um, for an African American, it was 15% enthusiastic, 68% comfortable, 8% have some reservations, and 4% very uncomfortable. So only a 12, you know, any somewhat, hmm, that's kind of interesting. And then Gallup asked it, this was in USA Today last week, um, people who said they would vote for a qualified candidate who was black, 94%. Now on here, a woman, uh, 21 enthusiastic, 59 comfortable, eight have some reservations, and eight very uncomfortable. On this one, 88% said they would vote for a qualified person who was a woman. I mean, so the thing is now, you know, admit, look, very few people are gonna say, I'm a bigot. Um, I mean, I. I but the thing about it is when you got to, um, um, well, the biggest single in terms of uh, very, I need new glasses, very uncomfortable, the highest very uncomfortable, there were two. A gay and lesbian person, 34% very uncomfortable, was tied with someone who has experience as a member of George W. Bush's cabinet. <laughs> And if you add in, have some reservations, the, um, it was 59% have some reservations are very uncomfortable for 59% for the Bush cabinet and 53% for gay and lesbian. Now, but no, I, I, the thing about it is I, I think we are sort of beyond this. What I'm just saying is more in the context of do something really safe just real safe, don't rock the boat, you know, and, 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 you know, do something that you could just take full advantage of any reason that anybody has not to vote for the other guys. You're not giving them any reason not to vote for your side. Now, do you give up some passion and energy and enthusiasm? Yeah, yeah, of course you do. But if the other side's got a lot of problems, Maybe, you know, that can be enough. But the data suggests that these, are two, these aren't big problems. And, 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 and frankly, I think if Hillary Clinton does not win, I don't think it's going to be because he's, she's a woman. And I think if Barack Obama doesn't win, I don't think it's going to be because he's an African-American. You know, I mean, I think these people are going to rise and fall on their own. Let's get the question back there midway. Stand the thing up, that, please. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. The thing that bothers me about Hillary is it means that this country will have been led by two families for a quarter of a century. Is this going to, does this bother anybody else? Uh, is this going to fly back and hit him in the face, if not her, then Jeb, if he runs? Well, I mean, I think it has hurt Jeb. I mean, in a sense that just sort of with the circumstances that you know, let's say he didn't have any need to go out making money and his family was gung-ho, let's do it, it still wouldn't be the right, because, just because of the circumstance. But I think what you're getting at is, I mean, we had a pair of Adamses back in the early days, and yeah, um, but, but I, think, I think what it says is that getting elected to public office is so horrendously expensive now that if you've got a household name, that is not terribly pejorative, you have a huge, huge advantage over somebody that's a Smith or a Jones or a Baker or somebody else. And, and, and that's why we see a lot of sons, daughters, nieces, nephews, I mean, a lot of people getting elected 
uh, whose names, you know, who, who were related to other people, but where it, it helped them break through. And, and um, you know, is it right? Is it fair? You know, that's for somebody else to decide, but I think it's, it's kind of so. Uh, because uh, virtually every two years, we see somebody walk in to, you know, Congress, let's say, who, you know, if their name was something else, they probably wouldn't have, they probably wouldn't have made it. But I think a lot of it has to do with name recognition. It has to do with, with uh, uh, having, being able to tap into uh, a financial network that had already been built before you came along. Um, you know, and all these things. I mean, it, it has to do with that. But, you know, yeah, it's kind of troublesome. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's clearly so. Do we have any, we haven't had a lot of questions from students. Do we have any students? You want to ask a question? We have one back there, and then then Mr. Langston right up here. Yeah, um, I was wondering because they're kind of we're starting, at least in my opinion, to see a change, at least in environmental and homegrown energy policy, like how people feel about it. Do you think uh, what validity do you think, uh, like a um, Gore Vilsack? ticket would be if they ran like Vilsack on the principle of you know stimulating the economy and Gore on you know saving the environment like do you think that they could you know really get independents that are conservatives but they see the uh, economy growth and well I mean uh, you know I, I mean I sort of went into I don't think Gore will fight for the nomination therefore I don't think he'll get it but that's not not what you're asking you know has has there been some movement in the last few years towards um, towards the environmental side and global, you know, climate change and all this? You know, yeah, there's been some, but you know, the thing is, I mean, take Al Gore for example. Um, may I stipulate that Hillary Clinton has high negatives? I mean, is anybody going to argue with that? Her negatives are the third highest in the Democratic Party, after Al Gore's and John Kerry's. Um, you know, the question is, does she have too much to win? Now, if she, whether she's above the line or below the line, um, Al Gore and John Kerry, uh, uh, you know, I, I that really be, I, I tell you what, the war would have to be going real bad um, for either of those guys, I think, to win a general election. So, no, I don't think either of those is going to happen. And with Vilsack, and I had breakfast with him one time, and he's a nice guy, and, you know, I think a very capable guy, and, and all like, but the thing is, you know, I, you know, I don't want to trash him or anything, but remember 92 when Senator Tom Harkin was running for president? And every other Democratic candidate said, well, not me. And nobody even would get anywhere near Iowa. They just, you know, the race started in New Hampshire and went on. But out of deference, I mean, for whatever reason, they gave Harkin, I mean, they just didn't even try to. And Steve, I mean, I, uh, Vilsack hadn't even been a speed dump, bump, bump, a uh, speed bump. I mean, he had slowed, I mean, they're piling in and, you know, they can't get to Iowa enough. And so I give a guy's running fourth or fifth in his home state, uh, yeah, that's not going anywhere, and I don't care what the issues are. So, you know, I don't think the uh, Gore, Vilsack, Vilsack, Gore, Gore, anybody, Vilsack, I don't think those are going anywhere, to be honest. Mark, you have a question? Evening, Mr. Coach. Um, I heard a lot of rumors um, from the DNC, and, and they're not, you know, official at any measure, but a number of conversations with a variety of people who seem to be hot on the idea of running TV ads that support the party and not any specific candidate. And I wondered what the sustaining effect that would have on uh, on uh, party identification. Well, you, you'd have to see the ads, and there used to be some of that. But I, I guess my, I mean, I'd, I'd have to want to see what they are. But my general thought would be, man, you better have everything else funded to the nth degree, Rolls Royce, everything before I'd waste any money on that. Um, I mean, would I? Uh, you know, I think. I'm, I'm saying this, I, I don't think that's a terribly productive thing for whether it's DNC, RNC, uh, you know, that's not where I would put my money. Now having said that, I'm going to kind of go over here a little bit. I think, you know, in the old days, 
you know campaigns running a campaign it was about making choices right you had to decide okay we're we're gonna we hope we'll have this amount of money and with this amount of money we got a budget so do we spend on this do we spend on tv radio this market this market direct mail phones you had to make tough choices tough critical choices now at least for the major candidates and i'm talking senate governor how i mean a lot of these are and obviously not this congressional race here but for most of these top tier campaigns they've got more money than they have any idea what to do with and so it's not a matter of making choices heck spend it all i mean there was a great there was an article on the front page of the washington post i think it was the day of or the day before the election where this woman from ohio you know obviously big key state called the post and how did they get she got the newsroom i don't know but anyway and she was like in tears because her mother who was getting you know hospice kind of care in home they couldn't keep the phone line open because they were bombarded by robocalls i mean i mean that that every minute every two minutes some candidate some campaign some interest group was just pounding away at them and where you turn on the tv set and you're just barraged and, and where it's way past the law of diminishing returns in terms of effectiveness and I, you know I see at that level you know they have more money than they know what to do with and so on this on the candidate level you know for most candidates it's not a shortage of money I mean no I mean whether anybody's listened to or not that's a really good question but you know they're not that short of money now long shots I mean, of course yeah 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 but for the parties I, I if I were you know my advice would be to either party you know spit it, spit it on building donor files spend it on I me mean, or, or voter files spend it on you know where if there's been a house race a senate race a governor's race an attorney general's race where you take when the phone banks call people and say you know who you're going to support where that's going to database so that you know you know this is somebody who when they do vote they vote our way but they don't show up most of the time you know you're crossing it with the voter files and you say ah that's I mean because to me that was that, that was the secret of the Republican the RNC 72 hour program it was finding people with a high propensity to vote Republican when they show up but who oftentimes don't show up and that way when you get that person to go to the polls you've accomplished something rather than drag you know trying to drag out somebody that's going to vote anyway i mean that's kind of a you know not terrible. or or trying to convince somebody to vote you know for your person who's probably just not going to vote anyway and so i i don't think that would be uh that's not where i'd spend my money we have uh we're going to do about two more questions we have a question right there the gentleman back in the center aisle On a macro level and a micro level, do the Democrats keep the Congress, both the House and the Senate, in uh, 08? And uh, what happens in a rerun of the Boyda Ryan race in this particular district? Next question. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the in the House, um, it, it's first of all, each side has their you know has their their talking points. You know, if you're a Democrat, you say, well gosh republicans won uh you know 12 15 seats by just one or two or three percentage points there are a lot of republicans that just barely won we still have opportunities to pick up seats okay and that's a very plausible talking point point. and then if you're a republican you say aha uh -huh, but there are a whole lot more democrats sitting in districts that bush carried twice than there are republicans sitting in districts that john Kerry and al gore carry won and so you know each side has statistics that they can use that are perfectly legitimate that argue the case for the other side is more vulnerable um, I, I think one thing I would watch is what's the political climate this year and very early next year and this is the political climate when incumbents decide do I run for re-election or not and, 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 and it's also can it recruit but in terms of the run for re-election or not you know you're um, uh, if you're if you're a Republican incumbent, you think you got a pretty good chance. Your side has a pretty good chance of getting their majority back in 2008, and you have a good shot at making that subcommittee chairmanship or something like that. 
uh, you probably want to, you know, might very well want to stick around. But on the other side, if you think you're probably not going to get back, then maybe you don't. And then it depends on whether you're in a competitive district or not, or whether you get strong candidates running or not so strong. It's environment, or whether your party is able to raise a lot of money. So the climate during the odd numbered year and the early, early part of the of the election year, it, it's it's awfully, awfully important. But I just think in the House, it's it's a we don't know yet. I mean, it, it's macro factors and these questions of recruiting and retirements and all that that will feed into it. And but if I had to bet, which would Repu which are Republicans more likely to pick up a majority, House or Senate? I would say House, and that would seem counterintuitive because the Senate's only fifty-one forty-nine, and boy, that's pretty close. So they only need one seat if they hold the White House, two if they don't. But the thing is, it's a question of exposure. And this is where the numbers, it, it, Republicans are kind of so near and yet so far on the Senate, because in 2008, you've got 21 Republican Senate seats up that they have to defend, and Democrats only have 12, 21 to 12. Now, when you've got a lot of incumbents up, you have to worry, does somebody call some kid in a crowd an ugly name? or something that someone thought was ugly or is there are you in a scandal is somebody else in a scandal is there I mean they're just they're just lots of things that can go wrong you're exposed and so you've got this 21 12 disparity of, of exposure for Republicans in the Senate and then you go to 2010 and it's 19 Republicans up that year only 15 Democrats up that year so in two elections it's what 40 and uh, 40 and 27 40 Republican seats at risk, only 27 Democratic seats. And it's not till 2012 that it turns around, and that's when there are 24 Democratic seats up and nine Republican seats at risk. That's when Republicans can hit the Powerball. Now, obviously, you know, political climate, lots of things happen that can drive these things, but the exposure, I actually would rather have the, the Republicans' odds in the House than the Republicans' chances of getting a majority back in the Senate, but that's just based on the exposure. In terms of this race, um, seeing the, the, the Lawrence paper this morning, um, if I were a Democrat, I would find that front page below the fold story very disconcerting because in a, in a wave election, a lot of people win. And some people win because they were fabulous candidates who ran great campaigns and raised a ton of money and did everything right. And some people, you know, it's that sort of general direction. And then some people are just real lucky and were running the right year and woke up on a Wednesday morning and they're a member of Congress. And when you think that, I mean, I think what you saw is somebody got swept in in a real big tidal wave and think they earned it on their own. And I, I wouldn't do what she's doing. Now, are Republicans going to rip each other up in the primary? Oh, very possibly. You know, again, can Republicans screw this up? Oh, you bet. But um, if I if I were the congresswoman, I would take my I would take help from anybody that would offer it that's never been indicted. Um, <laughs> and when the when you basically tell the party, eh, I can win on my own. I don't need you. And you were like a real, real long shot. And I, I don't. And, um, I uh, wow. Next question. <laughs> we have a gentleman back here, and then Sarah, if you would come up here, we're going to get one more right up here, and that's going to be it tonight. This uh, pres presidential election coming up has a number of unique characteristics. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, it's nearly one year before the first caucus, an unusually length long period of time. The number of, uh, of uh, primaries, early primaries afterwards are bunched. Thirdly, the number of candidates running is unusually large and no VP running. Given that, for any candidate or candidates in general, does that present any unusual opportunities or threats to a campaign, to running a campaign? Wow. 
Well, I mean, I think the schedule means money is everything. If you can't raise $70 million this calendar year, you're not in the hunt. And that's scandalous. Bill, what did you say that Senator Dole, they, you guys felt like you needed to raise in 87 or in 95, how much? Oh, I think it was, uh, we needed to have $20 million, $25 million. Yeah, yeah. And now we're talking $70 million bottom line. I mean, and maybe 80, 90, they'll probably, they'll, there'll be some folks over $100 million this year. And so the calendar and the front loading has clearly done that. Um, but at the same time, because you don't have a sitting vice president, or an incumbent president, a sitting vice president, or really just somebody that's a, a mortal lock on a nomination on either side. And what it means is that it's so har much harder for anybody on either side to break through. I mean, think about it. You're the, let's say you're NBC News or CBS or, you know, uh, you've got, you're expected actually now to make money, which didn't used to, but, but, but the thing is you've got a tight budget. And who do you send crews out? And if you've got a crew, I'm oversimplifying, but okay, if you're going to have a crew with McCain and a crew with Giuliani and a crew with Romney and a crew with Hillary and a crew uh, with Obama and, and a crew with, you know, let's just say Edwards, maybe you give one to Biden just because who the hell knows what he'll say, excuse me, but I, I mean, just for grins. How does a brownback, what does a brownback have to do to get television network coverage or, or a, uh, uh, you know, whether it's a Vilsack or whether it's, uh, you know, a, a Richardson? I mean, uh, because they're, they're double the number, actually there's more than, probably like three, four times the number of normal candidates running, it's just harder to get any attention. And you're all competing for the same, you know, 21, 22 minutes of network airtime, you know, the same news hole in the newspapers, the same, you know, in the big market, you know, in Iowa, New Hampshire. It, it, so it, I think it just makes it really, it, 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 makes it, it, it makes it so much harder for anybody other than one of the favorites on one side to break through. I think that's what it does. And, and I don't think this is good. I mean, I really don't. But I, I don't have a solution either. Okay, I'm going to exercise my prerogative of, as director of the Dole Institute. I'm going to have one other student question over here after Dr. Lee gets to ask his question. You have to wait for the microphone, though. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Uh, my question has to do with have we as a nation learned how to run elections enough so that uh, there isn't a joker in the deck or another way of asking it is, uh, has, has not, is there a question that you think should have been asked tonight that hasn't been? And I'm thinking especially of uh, Bush uh, versus Gore, but what's, what's the surprise thing that you might think could some suddenly, uh, or at some point during the election, turn things upside down and give us a, another national crisis, and et cetera? <laughs> And, and from your creativity, because you're the odds guy, you're, you're the Picasso. We're just odd guy, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, my, listen, I, I think, um, um, first of all, I'm not a big, uh, you know, October surprise person. I mean, I think each side, the process has gotten so cynical that each side firmly believes that there is nothing that the other party wouldn't stoop to to win an election. And so, you know, if they're Democrats in power, Republicans will expect an October surprise. If they're Dem Republicans in power, Democrats think so. And I, I'm not really an October surprise person. But the, the thing that I find most disconcerting, and it gets, does get to, that Flor to the Florida challenge, is that um, we spend nothing on the actual election, elections in this country. I mean, think about this for a second. Our election, you know, when you go to the polls and vote, what we're dealing with now is new, and this is with all due respect to anybody, new technology being administrated by temporary part-time elderly workers <laughs> with minimal, if any, experience. 
and 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 we're and then we're expecting infallibility and I, I'm told that this is not accurate but I bet it's not that far I mean I just wonder you know I don't think we probably spend much more money on elections county by county in this country than on food in the county jail and so this is like been we didn't expect accuracy just get it you know most of these races aren't close anyway who cares and then once you started getting to really close ones and you know who in the world would have thought you would have had the presidency come down to 438 votes in one state and then with some goofy does ballot design and you look at thought who thought this was a good idea you know and the ironic thing is it was a democratic election supervisor apparently that concocted the ballot design and so you know that but but the thing is you look at this and say you know either if we're going to expect these things if we're going to expect really accurate counts we're probably going to have to spend some money you know and maybe we should maybe we shouldn't that's for the public to decide but don't expect 100 percent accurate election results unless you're willing to to like do what it takes to to do to get that done you know i mean i think that's just a fundamental decision that that we're going to have to make and, and somebody was talking about you know debold this and that and paperless and how horrible this is and you know a guy i know that actually does some lobbying and on this stuff was telling me that you know the companies that make these new voting machines they would love to sell printers I mean, do you think they don't want to sell a piece of hardware and then specialized paper to put in the hardware? Do you think they wouldn't make more money? Of course they'd make more money. But the states and the counties don't want to spend the money. I mean, they don't want to spend the money on this piece of equipment, much less add another one on. And so, you know, you, I, mean, I, I think just we need to decide, you know, do we expect, do we want this thing just to be reasonably close? Or are we expecting like a real count, like a hard count? And just decide but I think that's where I mean we're spending so much of these guys running against each other and and really not much on counting the actual votes I, I wish we'd have fewer you know how about this tax campaign ads and have the money go towards count the vote but voting machines you know or you know something like, I'm, I'm just teasing but uh, anyway that's just sort of I got on my high horse but that's sort of why I'm like I you know but but there's always there's always something that you never know what you can't see and I can't see it and wish I knew and if I did I'd make a lot more money. I apologize for running over tonight but uh, Ms. Karen Bentley has our final question. Um, Mr. Cook, I was wondering if you expect any um, significant shakeups in the electoral map particularly um, in regards to like the interior west where you know Republicans who are likely to win the nomination may not represent the traditional Republicans of those areas? Well, I mean, I think we are seeing some shifts in voting patterns, and we have some going this way and some moving this way. And um, I'm going to look at my cheat sheet so I don't forget any. You know, what you've got is maybe, I, I just sort of canvassed some strategies on both sides and came up with four states that used to be pretty Democratic that are getting less so and seven states that used to be pretty Republican that are getting less so. And this doesn't necessarily mean, in some cases, they're switching sides, but in some cases, they're just, you know, becoming purple states, you know, in the middle, more, more in play. And, and, you know, my home state of Louisiana, I mean, it was trend, kind of moving away from Democrats some before Katrina, and now, depending upon, you know, there are somewhere between 60 and 100,000 fewer Democrats today than there were two years ago. And so, you know, that's a, st but it was already moving away from Democrats a little bit. West Virginia, you know, for cultural issues, that sort of thing, was moving kind of against Democrats. And then Minnesota and Wisconsin used to be pretty liberal, pretty Democratic places. They're now pretty swing, pretty much swing states now. And then go in the other direction, you've got Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, New Me and New Mexico. And part of this is Hispanic you know rising Hispanic populations and you know um, you know I think it's it's pretty unlikely Republicans are going to get a higher percentage of the Hispanic vote next time than they got you know last time or time before so there's that and then just new people moving in you know people from other states that are changing the, the traditional voting patterns of those states particularly people from California you know the joke in Nevada is that the state's getting Californicated 
Um, was that okay? <laughs> we'll edit it. Well, well, yeah. He had warned me. He had told me he had to warn somebody about their language. who was a speaker, of, you know, some time ago. But, but you know, so there's there's that, and then you've got uh, New Hampshire, where it's just sort of Massachusetts spilling over into New Hampshire. Over half the adults in uh, New Hampshire, by the way, weren't born there. So, I mean, that can change a state.